our amazing host and we can share a little bit about why we're here for SEL today. Oh, I'm excited about the it. Tri -Cities. Tri Cities, Southeast part of the state. Thank you for letting me know where that is, the Southeast, because I'm thinking, okay, it's Washington, right? That's right, yes. Yeah. And Tam, what, what time in the morning is it for you right now? Oh, it's 5.48 in the morning in Bangkok. Oh, it's early morning for you. Oh, I usually wake up at five. I think I think the webinar was on my mind, so I kind of woke up at like four, and and then I, I couldn't go back to sleep. So I was like, okay, well, time to wake up. And I was great. I had to. I added a few things to the slides, so I was like, yay. Great. Hi, Diane. How are you? Where are you? Where are you coming from? I'm I'm coming from Bangkok. I've never been to Washington. I've heard really great things. I've been to uh, Vancouver. Oh, Eatonville, Washington. Is that north, south, east, or west part of the state? Because I heard the eastern part of the state is very different than the western part of the state. It's so a big state, yeah. So I, I... It's a big state. And, and you know, like northern and southern Thailand, very different as well. Yeah, I was lucky. A, a long time ago, I lived in Bangkok for two years. Oh, oh wow. What a small world. Where did you live in Bangkok? Uh, I was in Bank. I, I was on uh, Sukhumvit Soy Bad. Oh, uh, so I, I worked at NIST. So you worked right, at right, NIST? Yeah, many years ago. What a small world. It's a great school. And when Jeff joins us, he worked at ISB. So I'm <sighs> not sure where he lived because I know that's a yeah, little that's bit Bank, it's out there, that. right? Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Uh, so for, for Diane and Brendan, I'm just trying to include you. Uh, we we're talking about. Uh, living in Bangkok, and uh, they went. They worked at the two premier schools in uh, Bangkok, and so it's really good school. And base of, of Mount Rainer, that's that must be absolutely beautiful. Um, I, I think, like my appreciation for mountains since I've moved to the Pacific Northwest, I just like there's something so comforting about. I don't know. Is it like the view of a mountain makes you feel small? It gives you that perspective of. It's beautiful. I remember, so I, I do work in Vancouver sometimes and um, wherever we drive when I, in Vancouver around the area, you could always see mountains. <laughs> and I was in Abbotsford, like outside, like uh, a rural part of, of British Columbia. And you could see um, Mount Washington from um, Vancouver, Vancouver side. And it's just this beautiful triangle. And you're like, wow. Yeah. What are your, um, what does, what's your weather like right now in Washington? So for folks in the chat, what's your weather like stormy? Because I'm a little bit further north. I'm, um, I live on a Gulf Island just off of Vancouver Island called Gabriola. It's a, it's a, it's a teeny tiny, well, it's the size of Manhattan, but population 2,500. Wow. We, we, we actually had some sunshine today, which was lovely. Wow, I know. I know the 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 Northwest usually gets it's stormy weather. It's a temperate rainforest climate. They said. It's interesting. Wow, so you live on an island. I do. Yeah, I traded. Uh, I was living in Singapore for a while, so I traded one very densely populated <laughs> island for uh, an island that, um, you know, like I have neighbors, but there's a lot of distance between us. Um. Okay, so you must be an international school teacher if you worked in Singapore then. That's right, yes. You probably worked at, did you probably work at a, um, UWC? That's right, so good guess. <laughs> it's a, if you're work, you work at NIST, you probably work at UWC. <laughs> that's so, that's um, a great deduction. Hi, Tony. Hi, Lorena. Hi, hey, Heather. We're just saying, uh, we're welcoming everyone to the session hello tell us where you're from and one thing that really went well this uh so far this week i'm from bangkok and uh what went well is that the kids came in little hustle uh halloween costumes we had three kids that um worked together they had little um bit, uh, like clips on their head and and one was a planet uranus of course another one was a star and another one was um a moon and so they like orbited each other. I love and, that. Yeah. That's super creative. And Heather, Heather lets us know she's driving. Okay. So Heather, we'll, we'll get where you're from a little bit later. 
uh, when it's easier for you to type. Thanks for joining us. I'm always impressed by, by folks who are turning in literally when they are on the road, like that level of commitment. Thanks for joining us, Heather. I'm really honored that you're going to do that on a Friday afternoon. On a Friday afternoon. On a Friday afternoon. It'll work out. You're showing up for kids. It's great. That's right. And Tony is celebrating that more students came to the afternoon jazz group on Zoom. That's amazing. Oh, my goodness. What was that like, Tony? <sighs> Tony says it can get crazy. I love that. Yeah, I bet. Oh, my goodness. I wonder how you manage all that. All the, all the jazz. So they pl they're playing at the same time? Because it, it requires kids like playing multiple instruments, right? A different instruments. That sounds crazy. Uh, they sing with their mics. Oh, that's adorable. Tony, you, I think you need to share. Uh, you need to teach us a session on how you make music happen online. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, again, like the creativity of educators throughout all of this is just so super inspiring. I was reading. Um, in this area, it's, you know, it's been difficult for a lot of organized sports, but there's been a big um, kind of uptick in cross country running. And what they did was instead of having like the race happen with all of the runners at once, they had different smaller heats. Mm. So it would be about 12 folks running and then they would do another heat. And, you know, you can still, of course, you have your time and it, you can still then have that competitive element. But I just thought what a simple way to tweak that make it a little bit safer. Um, and, and again, still, you know, those, those not extra, but you know, things like music, sports, all of those things for many students, like that is, that is school. That's what they look forward to. Yeah. And we make uh, just this year, I'm thinking, wow, the, the public image of teachers have completely risen and what, what, what teachers are doing. I'm like, I'm so impressed. And I see Lorena from, Yakima, Washington, T fifth grade. Let me tell you, elementary school is hard. And Lynette Powers, hello, Lynette, how are you? Good to see you. And Lorena has asked, do we have to sign in or are we good to go? Uh, Lorena, you are here. I do just want to remind folks that if you want to share information with us in the chat, you'll see there's that blue box. And unfortunately, the default is just to send to panelists. You want to click that downward arrow and have it change to panelists and attendees so that everybody can enjoy what you're sharing. It's a default setting that we can't do anything about. We wish that we could, but if you click that and make sure it's panelists and attendees, then we all get to enjoy. And also, I'm just going to get out of the way here. This will be here all throughout the session, but I do want to point out for those of you uh, Maybe I'll come over here, it's easier. For those of you who are on Twitter, if you are not following our host, you are missing out. So again, if you are on Twitter, we have his handle right behind my big head. Uh, do make sure that you follow Tan. He's like, you're always, always sharing outstanding resources. Like I feel like it's PD just following you on Twitter. Thank you. Oh, well, looking at the people here, we have a very international crowd. We have Lynette Powers from Abbotsford. We were just talking about Abbotsford. And we have, as you see right there, we also have Michelle Van Boken from uh, Burnaby, Bee, Canada. And so across the border, so we have Northwest friends here. Hello, good to see everybody. Tell us what is one thing that, what, uh, what is something that went well for you this week? Joy from Bellingham. Hello. Uh, hi, Brittany. Good to see you. We see Heather from Sail High, Washington. Uh, and work for uh, Takima. I think there, there are two people who are already here from for Takima. This is fantastic. We have just a few more minutes uh, before we go. And I will now share the screen. Sharing. Sound perfect. Okay. So great to hear from Lorena that uh, students are starting to enjoy those Google Meets, oh, those okay. synchronous meetings more. That's really powerful. And I love Brittany shares one thing that went well this week was finally getting some struggling students to come to a Zoom and find their aha moments. 
Uh, we're able to engage synchronously. That's really powerful. Thanks for sharing that. How did you, how were you able to do that? I would love to know. So we, we could all share and learn together. Wow, aha moments. Yeah, I think the power of synchronous learning is that was, that is what shifted my, my instruction. Um, but my first eight weeks of instruction, I was basically having students here, watch videos, do the work and I'll catch you up and I'll, I'll catch you for not doing the work. But when I have kids come online, do synchronous work, they always wanted to be there. So let's see. So for those of you just joining us, a reminder again, um, I know that we're going to have a lot of uh, prompts to get in the chat and to share our thoughts. Tan has already started doing that so far. Um, if when you're in the chat, you see that blue box, please do make sure that you've selected the down arrow and it says panelists and attendees. That's the way that we'll make sure that everybody is able to see what you're sharing. And of course, welcome to Jeff the amazing person behind SOS podcast and this free webinar series. How are you doing today, Jeff? Good. How are you? The amazing person. Jeez Louise, you could have just led with person. <laughs> that would have been totally fine. You're an amazing uh, person. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Tan. How are you, my friend? Good to see you. I heard now we have an international school connection. You worked at uh, ISB in Nichita. Yes, I did. Small world. Uh, Small world. For those who are, um, teach who are in the U.S., when we teach abroad, Basically, it's the smallest community possible. Yeah, don't I burn, agree. <laughs> don't burn for kids because you hear all of them. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take long for sure. It doesn't take yeah. long for sure. And awesome. Again, thanks, well, welcome. Thanks, Stan, for dropping the link to the slides. I know we, in the last moment, just had a few more folks join. So I've put that link in there again. Uh, okay. And if you've, if you've missed it, that's okay. Jeff and I will continue to drop that in. And I see people are writing things that um, are ready in the session. Uh, for example, Sarita said she made chit chat videos for students. That's great. And people are responding like, what is something that you've done to recharge your batteries? Or you can say, what is something that you've done to, um, like what, what went well this week for you? You could choose two of those, one of those two. And I see other ones said, um, Heather said, I use Google Forms for quick quizzes and high attendance. Oh, it's, well, how did we teach without technology before? And I think a, really a lot of- good question. Right. And now I think teachers are um, gonna leave this experience in the future of virtual teaching. Uh, before maybe they might've been reluctant uh, tech users, but now they're probably less reluctant. And so I'm sure kids appreciate that. Okay. I, should we start? Okay, I'll let you take it over. All right, well, again, welcome everyone. Thank you for checking in all the way from British, British Columbia. We got some Canadians in the house other than Trisha. Look at that, that's gonna be fun. People coming from all over the place. Thank you so much for joining us on this Friday afternoon. I hope you are safe, healthy, uh, and you and your family are doing well in these crazy times that we have. So great to have Tan here to talk about social emotional learning uh, within the distance learning context, uh, joined by the one and only Trisha Friedman. So it's always great to have Trisha here uh, supporting and helping along the way as well. You are going to want to make sure down at the bottom, uh, we haven't found a way to automatically do this yet. This is one of my things with Zoom. Uh, but down at the bottom as you're in the chat, you're going to want to make sure that you change. There's a little blue box that says panelist. And if you click on it, you should be able to change that to panelist and attendees. So if you change that to panelists and attendees, then we all get to see the full chat. Uh, if it's just as panelists, you're only talking to Tan, uh, Trisha and I, and so uh, if you turn that to attendees and uh, attendees, you can, uh, we can all take part in that. So awesome. People here from Kennewick, uh, David Toblin's here. He's from down in Southern, uh, Southern Washington state. So it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, and so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to turn it over to you, Tan. I'm going to mute myself and just enjoy learning from you today around social emotional learning and distance learning. Thanks, Dan. Take it away. Well, thank you, James, for sure, for having me. And I just want to like have a big, the biggest round of applause for teachers who are attending right now. 
The reason is because it is 4.30 in the afternoon, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, in most places uh, in the West, of course, where you're coming from. And people are driving home. And people, some people are probably cooking right now, and some people may be doing laundry, and people are maybe just wrapping up from their classroom. And the fact that you are here for your kids and your teachers at four in the afternoon is like, it literally just gave me chills right now. I'm like, yes, because I don't know if I could do that at four on a Friday. So welcome. I just wanted to model what I just did um, for you before with people who were coming in. Uh, we came early and Trisha and I were narrating, we were talking, we were trying to connect to teach, uh, the teachers and the participants here. We were saying their names. I think that's really important, just saying someone's name um, and greeting them virtually at the door or in person is important. Let me show you uh, this. So I provide anonymous feedback. Hi, hi Tori. I, I ask for students for anonymous feedback all the time, and these were my responses from my sixth grade, my unit one, this is this year, right? And the bottom, one of the questions was, please explain uh, the answer from above. I asked, how comfortable do I make you feel? And uh, there are lots of responses, and this one is one I want to show you in particular. It said, I think that you care uh, of students very well. Even in the beginning of class, you say hi to us and bye to us. And this is what I do. I literally stand at my door. That's my little door right there. And I greet kids. And there's a little string at, at, at the handle so that the, uh, we, we make it safe for kids. And so I'm the only one allowed to touch the string and the door. And so I hold the door for kids. And I greet them. I say hello and goodbye to them. And that's something simple you could do. And a lot of my strategies are going to be um, just for distance learning, but also they're going to be in person when you come back because SEL is all the time. So as you're talking, I would love to, as you chat, please, if you feel something, if you feel like you want to say something, please uh, participate and contribute to the chat. And you, could, you can have conversations with the participants as well. So let's move on. Uh, there are five strategies that I want to share with you. And they have come from uh, the, the Institute of uh, Social Emotional Learning for a Positive Behavior in, in, in Australia. And I interviewed um, David Bott, and he is the vice uh, deputy director of, of the institute. And it's basically like a school that's devoted to uh, social emotional learning, and it's a lab school. And people come around the world to visit that school to learn how they implement it. It's, a, it's basically a, a, one of the premier schools in Canada, and sorry, in Australia. And there are five strategies. Um, and I'm going to go through them uh, throughout, but I just want to introduce uh, you to them in the chat you can talk, start talking about uh, which one do you think you already do, because you probably already do a lot of these things if you're already showing up here. The first one is unteach. It means start a lesson with an activity that helps students connect with other students and you. And I will we'll model this in a second. The next one is build trust. Be prepared and be professional at all times. Um, that's how you build trust with students as, as a professional. Play, create a place, create a space, an opportunity to laugh and play with kids. And this doesn't always mean games, but this means a sense of playfulness. Uh, the last two are speak human and teach skills. This means use stories to teach language of, of emotions and well-being. And the last one is be human. This means share with appropriate judgment your personal stories to help students realize uh, that, that these things, how you are applying them as well. So, and Trisha, Jeff, if you see anything that people are saying through the chat, please continue to, uh, to contribute and talk. And uh, so it'll sound like less like a monologue for me, okay? Okay, we're not gonna play this one. We're gonna play uh, a different game. We're gonna do, let's start, play, let's start, let me model with you. Let's do the unteach strategy first. So before we get into the content of the class, I would like to play a game with you. Uh, this is called object interviews. What's going to happen is uh, we are going to, I'm going to be the object. I'm going to be the person with the object. I have a school friendly object that I want you to take a guess. And you're going to take a guess by um, typing in the chat and Jeff and Trisha will help me narrate that. Um, what you're going to say is you're going to ask me yes or no questions and I'm going to say yes or no until you get closer to the guess. For example, you might say, is it something you can eat? And I will say yes or no, all right? So what, what would you like to ask me about my object? 
So Cindy asks, can you write with it? Uh, you cannot write with this, Cindy. Good question. Thank you. Can you write on it, Joan asks. Oh, Joan, you, it's super small. You can't write on it. Can you hear it from Darla? Uh, you can hear it if you drop it on something metal. Yeah, hi, Darla. Joy asks, is it something that helps with strategies? Oh, it is. It is not something that helps with strategies. Thanks, Joy. Uh, Cindy asks, do you hold it in your hands? Hi, Cindy, you can hold it in your hand, but it's usually not held in the hand. Tori wants to know, is this a tech item? Oh, Tori, it's not a tech item. It has no buttons. Uh, no Lorena wants to know, can you taste it? Oh, you can taste it, but it doesn't taste very good. You can't eat it. And a, a perfect follow-up question to that from Lucy, does it smell good? Oh, it has no smell, no odors. Mm. Nina wants to know, can you sit on it? Oh, Nina, if you sit on this, you it might hurt. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> Ooh, <wrong> okay. <laughs> Brandon wants to know, Brandon, I think, is um, making a deduction based on your background. He wants to know, is it found in a kitchen? Oh, it's not found in a kitchen, Brandon. Uh, Michelle wants to know, can it grow? Oh, it's not. It's fixed forever. It's fixed forever. Fixed forever. Yeah. Wow. It's been like that for thousands of years. So Dawn is going out on a limb and she's just making a guess. Dawn wants to know, is it a paperclip? Oh, it's not a paperclip, but it is metal. Very close, Dawn. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to think here. We did taste. Is it alive? Uh, is it, Judy wants to know, is it made of metal? It is made of metal. So we know that it's small. That's why it's odorless. That it's why uh, when you drop it, you can hear it. It can fit in your hand, but it's not we've, usually in your hand. Okay, we've got another guest here from Tobias who asks, is it a fork? Oh, it's not a fork. Thanks, Tobias. Uh, I'm trying to find another one here. Oh, Rebecca wants to know, is it squishable? It's not squishable. It's really, really small. Sandra wants to know, is it something that's found in a teacher's desk? Uh, it's, it's usually not found in a teacher's desk. It's usually found in a store. Usually people usually buy it. Mm. I'm trying to find one. Uh, Courtney wants to know, can you cut with it? Oh, you, uh, can, you can be creative and try to cover it, but you can't. So it's not a knife. <laughs> I will give you an example. It is something you can see right here, possibly, in my face, around my face. And I'm going to combine questions here from Michelle and Tobias, who want to know, does it have any either historical or cultural associations? Oh, it does. It has an, a historical association to my life. It was a gift that a friend gave me, and I'll tell you the story when you are almost close to guessing it. We'll take three more guesses, and then I'll reveal it to you. All right, so Julie wants to know, is it a very old button? Oh, it's not an old button, but very thoughtful. It's the okay. size of a button, and it's metal. Oh. Christine asks, is it an earring? Oh, it's not an earring, but you can wear it. Getting closer, everybody. Is it, uh, Michelle wants to know, is it a necktie? It is something around the neck, but it's not a necktie. Uh-oh, we're getting closer. <laughs> it's getting fun. Look at the responses. So Christine asks, is it a chain? It is a chain. Yeah, Christine. Yay. Are you ready? I'm for you now. I hope you can see this. It's a little necklace that has an anchor on the bottom. It looks like an anchor, like a ship anchor. Mm-hmm. And it was given to me on my last day in Laos. Uh, my ex-boyfriend, uh, a group of friends were saying goodbye to me on the, in the, at the airport. And uh, before, before he gave this to me, before I left on the plane, he, before like many days before, he gave me this as a birthday gift. And he said, because I know he knew I was leaving to go to Vietnam. And he said, no, no matter where you are, remember that you are always anchored in Laos. And so my last day, I surprised him with a little gift. Um, a little, a little, a little um, uh, pennant, a little necklace that um, had a ship on it. And I said, 
if you are my anchor and I am your ship, no matter where I go, I will remember, I will remember to be anchored with you, to you. Right? And so, so let me just step back. That was the purpose of that, that play. Right? So we, uh, we start each lesson or a lesson or once in a while, start a lesson that helps students connect to each other. And so uh, you, if you notice that Trisha and, and Jeff and I were saying your name and having you participate, and the game was, there are no points, it's not competitive, there are no outs. And when we do this, it helps students uh, build, build community. And so here are the different other games as well. But uh, you have, you have the, the, the link to the presentation, so you can use it with your students. And I just created this out of thin air, and I thought, oh, okay, uh, that's how we do it. And I kind of right. just want to repeat that, Tan, because that was a question that we got. Folks were wondering, I think they're already, you know, like liking that, that game and would love to bring that to their students or staff. So just to kind of repeat, the, the link is there in the chat and, and you're fine with folks using your Absolutely. slides. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Every student that, everything I share that has already been given permission by parents to, to share with teachers. So yeah, there are some strategies games here for you. And you can create more, of course. But the goal is to have no points not but not be non-competitive no outs to develop a community because when you are developing a community when there are points you feel there's less and there's people who have more so uh this is the question for our session how can we integrate sel within our lessons so we're going to uh, watch this for a second when i go with students and i i, I greet them this is what i do this is me during uh, virtual instruction with students. Let's watch. Like, oh, I'm not doing very well. Uh, I'm tired. I'm really not okay. Five meaning like I'm really great. Where are you? Three. I'll give you a context. This, these are my kids in March, February-ish last year. And during uh, the, the pandemic in Vietnam when we had to shut down. And these students came early to my session. And so uh, I made sure I just greeted them like I kind of did with you. So let's watch. Oh no, sorry. Like, oh, I'm not doing very well. Uh, I'm tired, I'm really not okay. Five meaning like, I'm really great. Where are you? Three. Three, okay, normal. Yeah, it's like there's a lot of work, but like I can do it. There's a lot of, how are you help, How are you managing your time? Um, like good, it's like I can do all, all the, that day work in one day. Are you taking breaks? Uh, yeah. yeah. I hope everything is going better for you boys because I'm changing the science to make it more manageable. Is it more manageable now? Yeah. And more easy for science. It's more accessible. Okay. Uh, mm, do you? Three. Three. I have two threes. Bung and you and, and Benson. It's <laughs> good. Hey, Benson, I want to show you my dog. Can I show you my dog? This is my dog. Can you see him? Wow. This is my dog. These are my dogs in Lao. Wow. He got lost. I don't know where he is anymore, but this is my dog. I, he still lives with uh, my housekeeper. And this is a gift from my ex-boyfriend. So we still, if this is Friday and this is Bobo. You got to show me your pictures of your dogs. Okay. Um, I'm missing Simon and James. Hey, Simon. Good to see you. We were just saying hi. How are you? Everybody say Brivet to Simon. That means hello in, Sp in Russian. Say Brivet. 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 Simon, can you tell us, teach us how to say hello? Brivet. Say it again. Brivet. Okay. okay. Good try. Good try. Okay. Um, this is what you're going to do. Simon, one to five. How are you feeling? One, meaning like I'm not feeling good. Five, I'm feeling great. Three. Okay, so we have three All right. Can you do me a favor? Please turn on your cameras for a few seconds so we can say we can wave to the girls and I'll share with them the this. Thank you, Simon. Keep it just waiting for you. Uh, uh, okay, so wave to the girls. 
Great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye. Now listen, uh, Ethan and Simon, you can go watch the video. Go to group three. Hung and Mindy, please watch the video and go to group four and come back to group one if you need my help. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Jihu and Benson, I don't know where James is. Oh, hi. Oh, Jihu. Bây giờ là con với lại Minh Trí là vô group four hả con? Right now. Yeah, you can go to group four. Okay, so that was a video. Is there anything that, so I just wanted to say, that's how I greeted my students. They came online and then I uh, talked to them for a few minutes before I sent them to their groups. I also want to say that uh, I know that this is this is a learning curve for me. Uh, like, oh, I'm not doing this. I put students into boys and girl groups, but then I realized like after doing this presentation many times, that oh, well, many students don't identify as boys or girls. And so in the, they, my students have asked to be put into boy groups and girl groups instead because they feel more comfortable with that. Um, but in the future, I think I'll just ask students to be in groups and then mix them up. So what have people said, uh, Tracy and Jeff? So we, it was interesting, like a lot of people really just talking about how in a casual conversation, you brought in so many different things, that idea of language learning, um, you know, of sharing personal information, of, you know, the student engagement. And we also had a little bit of an aside. We had a, a question asking about cameras off. You know, is is that okay? And some schools um, and some some folks have differing feelings on that. So I just shared. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen Edutopia did a really great piece on why cameras off sometimes just you know might make students feel a little bit more comfortable. And I thought Tan, your example there where cameras off were off, but engagement was one hundred percent on. Yes, that's exactly it. Right. My my goal, I guess, the the, the thing about SEO is that my, I want my kids to be comfortable and engaging. And if they dislike cameras, I always say, here are options. When you turn on your camera, it makes you feel like you're part of a community. Uh, when you turn off your camera, it might not feel that way. However, you get to choose between the camera off or the camera on. As an adult, when I go to meetings online, I always have my camera on so that I can be more focused so and also that people can see that I'm part of the community. And so I always tell them the reason why. Part of SEO is always saying, here, here are the, my decisions, here are my actions, here are my reasons why. So we are modeling for students what, we, what we're thinking. And so it goes back to this. It talks about um, being human. You're sharing your, your, your strategies, uh, but you're also using, you're also speaking human and teaching, teaching skills at the same time. Every opportunity for interaction is an opportunity to teach uh, SEL. Well, I even like, like, even when you ask the boys to wave to the girls, they like turn their cameras on, yes. they kind of do the half wave thing, and then the cameras go back off. But yeah. even just like those are little moments, right, that build this idea of turning your camera on or being seen by others like, uh, uh, and just small little interactions like that. I, I found that really, it was really fun because it's fun. As soon as they're done waving, they all shut their cameras back off again. Yes, that was the, and cause I, I, because they, they were at two different groups. So at uh, the boys were at 10 to 10.30 and the girls were at 10.45 to 11.15. But I wanted to let them know that they're still part of a community, a bigger class community because I can only facilitate five groups at a time, really four groups at a time. So I had my students separate, but I, but I wanted to let them know that they're still part of this class and that they're doing the same thing. And I had, when I worked with the girls, I had the girls do the same thing. They came on and they turned off the camera, which is fine. And I say, all right, you're gonna wave to the boys so I can send this video. I create a video for kids and the welcome video so the kids can say, oh, hey, I can see the other kids. Because I was trying to form a connection to say that even though you're home in your separate locations, you are in, you are part of one community. Thanks, Jeff, for noticing that. Okay. So let's do this. Um, I have two videos for you. We're going to watch this one, and I'm going to teach content now. I'm going to actually teach you a plot diagram, and so that's our content, which is a plot, the, the structure, the parts of a plot. But we're going to integrate SEL, um, and I'm going to ask you this question at the end. What does Catherine's story teach you about how we see people? Right? So pretend you are my students, and I'm going to teach you a, a parts of a plot diagram. So we're going to use this as our text together. This is from Tara Brock. She's a meditation teacher. Oops, sorry. 
Ingram, Catherine Ingram tells a story about a friend of hers who uh, was uh, in a grocery store in California and the friend was um, going up and down the aisles and she became aware of a mother with a small boy moving in the opposite direction. And this is how the friend describes it. They were meeting us head on in each aisle. The woman barely noticed us because she was so furious at her little boy who seemed intent on pulling items off the lower shelves. As the mother became more and more frustrated, she started to yell at the child and several aisles later had progressed to shaking him by the arm. At this point, my friend spoke up. A wonderful mother of three and founder of a progressive school, she probably never once in her life treated any child so harshly. I expected my friend would give this woman a solid mother-to-mother -mother talk about controlling herself and about the effect this behavior has on a child. I was braced for a confrontation. Instead, my friend said, what a beautiful little boy, how old is he? The woman answered cautiously, he's three. My friend went on to comment about how curious he seemed and how her own three children were just like him in the grocery store, pulling things off shelves, so interested in all the wonderful colors and packages. He seemed so bright and intelligent, my friend said. The woman had the boy in her arms by now and a shy smile came upon her face, gently brushing his hair out of his eyes. She said, yes, he's very smart and curious, but sometimes he wears me out. My friend responded sympathetically, yes, they can do that. They're so full of energy. As we walked away, I heard the mother speaking more kindly to the boy about getting home and cooking his dinner. We'll have your favorite, macaroni and cheese, she told him. We'll stop there. Let's go to the part of the lesson now. Let's start here. Uh, in the chat, let's participate. Okay? I'm gonna start off with in the beginning. In the beginning, we are in a grocery store and the main characters are uh, Catherine Ingram, her friend, uh, a, a mother, who not, and then her son. And then they, he wants something, and she's not giving it to him. That's the mother. And they're, they're, and Catherine and her friends are just observing the interaction. Okay, let's go in our chat. What's the first mini problem? And uh, Trisha and uh, Jeff, you can help narrate this if possible. So Lucy says he's pulling things off the shelf. Yes, what's the next problem? Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> Sandra says problem one, shopping with kids. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then what's the next mini problem after he's pulling things off? Uh, both Christine and Brittany point out that the mother gets upset, she yells at the son. Yes, and then that's, what's the next mini problem after that? Darla says there becomes a tug of war. Yes, and then what does, let's go to the next one. So let's go to the, what does Catherine Ingram and her friend do? Well, really her friend. Uh, Christine shares the friend talks to the mom and Darla yeah. points out not just speaks with, but calmly speaks to the mom. Yes. And what does the mom, what does Catherine's friend say? to the mom. Uh, Julie says comments on the boys uh, po uh, positives. Ah, so right, that's the positives, yeah. And do you know what she says particularly, in particular? Uh, Courtney says she uh, connects with her and says, you know, her kids are, are just like the other mother's children. Ah, uh, yes, there's a connection right there. And let's go to the resolution. What, what is the, how does the story end? And they part their ways. Macaroni. <laughs> yeah, lots of macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Mac and, and cheese. <laughs> Coming up to dinner Must time, be, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yes, the mom yes. speaks, the mom, uh, Joy writes, mom speaks more kindly. Darla says, mom is now calm and sees the good side of her, of her son. Well, that is, you just, what we did was we, every story has a beginning and you just identified that with me. And there are many problems that add up and add up and add up. The climax, the event that is most suspenseful, like what's going to happen next? And the resolu resolution is, okay, 
how does the story end? Where do the characters go at the end of the story? And what happens to them? So that's our plot diagram. And we're gonna be continuing to learn this structure throughout the unit. I just wanna take a moment though, to tell you a story about uh, my family. This is my little niece. Her name is Ngop, and this is her little sister. Her name is An. And uh, this is a this is I want to sh share with you a connection with the story that we just read or watched. Um, when I talk to my nie uh, my sister or my mother about my nieces, I often notice that that they'll say, "Oh, An has is really strong spirited, um, and she's so independent." But Ngop is very dependent and she can't do things her, by herself. So they're very strong, different personalities. As you can tell this little picture, she's like, no, I'm gonna water it for you, not you, right? So, and I always tell them, hey, you have to be careful. You, we can say that together here, but make sure that they're not in the room when we say this, because the things we say will, will become seeds that are planted in their subconscious, and then they'll start to believe that that Ngop, for example, might believe that she is less than because she's not as independent as her little sister, right? And so uh, that's what, that's my story. Very similar to Catherine Ingram's story where we talk about, um, hey, it's the way we talk, the way that uh, Catherine's friend talked about the little kid changed the way the mother saw the little kid. And the same thing here. And I, I encourage my mother and my sister to say, the way we talk about, the way we describe our kid, our, uh, our nieces um, is the way that they will believe in them. They will believe themselves. And so we have to be careful about how we say things. Um, and so that's how, that's my little lesson. Yeah. So I just wanted to share with you, oh, sorry, what I just did. Um, I taught content but I use an opportunity to be human by saying, oh, here, here's a story about my real life, how it connects to the story. And I just wanna share with you a strategy, or I just wanna share with you a social emotional skill. Right? And, but content was the main thing. Content or the story of the plot, di or the plot diagram was the main thing. And the aside, of me talking about my nieces, just added a little element of saying, hey, I'm gonna speak through stories, so, but I'm, I'm gonna teach skills. And when I teach skills, I share my own story, my own life. Okay. Are there people chatting? Do you notice anything? No? Okay. Trisha or no, sorry, we just had a request for the link to the slides again. So those, that's just been put there for anybody that missed it going around the first time. Oh, okay, okay, great. Feel free to continue chatting because this will be like uh, Jeff and I narrating. Jeff and I and Trisha will be narrating the conversation on the side and the chat room. So it's really great if you can continue to chat because that's how you can continue to process. Let me just share with you. So this is what I do um, with my kids. So for example, grade eight, I had anonymous feedback again. And I, this unit was talking about hu human rights. The unit was human rights. And I used that opportunity to, the case study that we studied was LGBT rights. And I talked about my experience being a gay man uh, from um, what it was like to be in school, what was it like to go to the prom, what was it like to have a boyfriend. And I was talking about like thinking about, I remember when um, in the US, the legislation came out when we were when a same-sex marriage is allowed to happen now, and I talked about these things. And this is a survey, and I and someone said, "Hey, how do I make you feel?" That was the first question, and then the second question was, "Please explain from above." And a student said this: "Mr. Tan is really is nice and friendly. He talks about his personal life, GLBT prom, etc., which makes me feel more comfortable." Right? So I wouldn't I would not be sharing these strategies with you unless my students have. I see the results of my students. Right? So that is right there, speaking human by telling stories because humans tell stories and that's how we learn lessons. But we also learn lessons by adding with proper appropriate judgment, things that we're that experiencing in our life. Let me continue with the concept of stories. This is by Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop. And she says, children need windows and mirrors. They need mirrors in which they see themselves and windows to which they see the world. And how do we do that? And she said, well, basically through stories. 
this is for a book that just came out from um, Rebecca Bellingham. And she's a Heinemann author. And she wrote a book called The Artful Read Aloud, 10 Principles to Inspire, Engage, and Transform. And what Becky, Rebecca Bellingham, and Rudin Sims Bishop said is that basically we teach stories. Teaching stories is one of the most effective, flexible, durable tools that we have to teach students SEL. And we already have stories. In every single content area, we have stories of scientists, we have stories of authors, we have non we have uh, fictional stories, right? To, to, tell, to tell students, to teach students content, but also to opportunities to teach life lessons and skills. So let me move to another topic here. Um, how do you provide feedback to students? This is what, uh, this is my frame. I, I wanna see if you can notice in the chat, let's see if you can notice what I'm doing. So I would say, when you, it, when you drew pictures after reading the word, it helped you visualize all the information. Keep this up. If you want to, you can. If you wanna organize your ideas, you can plan your ideas out in sticky notes. I see you using sticky notes, keep that up as well. I noticed that you, this makes, I noticed that you wrote the, that vocabulary word in your home language over the English word. This makes it easier to remember that word. So what do you notice the pattern is? So we have cause and effect from Joy and Dawn points out this is also teaching algorithms. Yes, very much so. It's, it is cause and effect. There is a cause, student action, and the result of student action. And that's how um, I am more conscious about using feedback. I've been using this with my kids, even in writing. And they're like, is this a positive or a negative? Because they're used to hearing, great job, great job. And so now what I do at the end is I say, keep this up or do more of this or try to do this more. So kids understand it. And I... Tobias has also pointed out, you know, this is observation followed by strategy, but we have a few participants just wanting you to take a step back and, and you know, of course, in education, sometimes when we share personal stories, um, yeah. you know, students might not have the reaction that we expect, or sometimes when we're sharing stories, they might be confronting to their own personal experience. So we had a few people just who wanted to know uh, if you had any advice on handling that. Oh, yes. Uh, I make sure you don't take it personally. And the one thing is, so for example, LGBT, right? Um, I, at the end of my survey, I had two, two students write that I'm homophobic. Uh, they wrote, I am homophobic as part of their anonymous survey. So um, what I do is I say, here, here's, this is what it's like for me. I am not trying to convince you to uh, support LGBT rights. I'm not trying to convince you to be against it. I'm just showing you what my experience is like. And I want you to make your judgment about how you, where you stand. Right? And then when a, and when a student says something that's confronting, um, I make sure that I don't take it personally and um, that I just ask them, can you explain more of what you mean? Ah, and I, re and I respond and I say, okay, so you're saying this, is that what I'm hearing? And then I just reflect it back to them and then I move on and say, okay, I got it, not a problem. And I try not to, and when I know that okay, this is something that I can't argue with, or this is something that um, maybe is too sensitive, or right now they're not at this point where they can understand it. And I say, I just wanna let you know that I hear what you're saying. Doesn't mean I agree with them, but I just wanna let you, I heard what you said. Thank you for that. And that's it. I hope that was helpful. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Uh, so let's watch this little, very, very short clip of me doing virtual instruction again. Um, I was working with uh, Coco and uh, I, she was a, she's a struggling student, was a struggling student um, during uh, distance learning who wasn't, and she needed that extra help. So we had tutoring sessions in the afternoon. Me and uh, three other students uh, would come to a tutoring session and this one was just her. And uh, watch what I do with students and how I integrate SEL right away um, without having like, here's a lesson, let's sit down students. Hi, Coco. Welcome back. What do you notice when you take a break after working for like 30 or 40 minutes? I feel really good. Why do you feel really good? Because I 
because I can rest. Because you can rest, okay. So in the future, what can you do when you work for a long time? Um, rest for five, six minutes. Okay, because it gives you energy. All right, let's go back to your work. What do you have to do now? So the, before I forgot to tell you the context, I, when she came to the tutoring session, I noticed she was really lethargic and I said, do you need a break? Do you wanna just lay down for 30 minutes and then come back when you're ready? Um, and she said, yeah, that'd be great. And we set a timer and she, when she came back, I took, what did you notice that I did? <laughs> this is how I'm trying to engage uh, participants as like, are we getting engaged students? Lucy has said, and I, I think this came out in, you know, in the kind of the, the past five minutes or so, just how calm you are and how that really like radiates through. And even I'm thinking, Tan, just how as an SEL strategy, like your calmness is kind of contagious. Uh, and Jeff pointed out, you know, you've got a one to one, the kids camera isn't on, but you're rolling with it and the engagement is is still there. Uh, Lucy says, encouraging that positive self care and folks just again, mentioning how important it is that you're checking in. And Christine says, reminding her that, you know, she can take use of, of taking, taking breaks on her own. So I, I know, you know, Jeff, we've had so many conversations about student agency and students being right. empowered. And that's, uh, that's such a crucial part of it, right? That they also know yeah. when they need to step away. Yes. Yeah. And I love that idea, right? Like even just the idea of reflecting, you know, when she came back, reflecting on taking that break, like, how do you feel now? Why do you think you feel different? Right? Like just helping students understand uh, as we are all running at a million miles an hour. And so are our students to take care of yourself. And, and why do you feel different after you take a nap or you lay down or you just, you know, go and watch the sunset or whatever it happens to be for you. Right. So I think my, I think everyone, what everyone is saying is, is spot on. I think my uh, practice currently is trying to slow down my practice mm. and that really helps students. And, and when we slow down, we find opportunities to say, oh, hey, what did you notice? Uh, what can you do? How did that make you feel? And so I noticed that she was really tired. She went, I let her go take a break. And then I say, what can you do in the future when you are tired? Because someone said it, I think she, uh, Cindy said it. Oh yeah, it's about it's about self advocacy and being uh, and advocating for yourself and saying I need this, I would like this. This is how I feel, and that's what we're doing with SEL. We're teaching students the skills that we want them to have. Because I'm no longer her teacher, but I still want her to develop the skill of saying I feel this right now. It, can you help me provide that? Right. And so that's the LSE strategy. And Julie points out that, you know, when you, when you're having that conversation that you're also giving them almost sort of like sentence starters or the opportunity to use a frame that you've already given them. And I'm, I'm guessing that's also intentional. Yes. Super intentional. The language that we use is always like, here's what you did. And how did you feel when you did that? So we're not trying to say like, we're, tra we're using less value judgment and we're saying action-based and result-based language. So kids can say, oh, I am in control of the feelings that I have. And I do this with my students as well. Um, so this is in writing as well, when I give feedback to students. This is his writing that he had to do, hung, and I wrote this. And he said, I noticed how you wrote the first two paragraphs to be an introduction. Then you wrote a very special sentence that starts with because. When you use this transition, it helps connect the previous idea to the next one. That communicates your ideas more clearly. And I would say, I would add, like, keep this up. So that right there, I'm using, again, this strategy with in-person orally, uh, but I'm also using this with students in writing. And Cecilia has mentioned in the chat um, how much she kind of admires the vocabulary that you're using and that you're teaching students to be advocates for themselves. Um, and uh, I, I wonder if actually you just want to speak a little bit further on like how you realized, you know, why it was important and how to do that. Uh, here's the answer. I read this book called What We Say and How We Say It Matters. So I think everything I'm doing is always saying, um, okay, where can I learn this from? What's an expert? Who's an expert? And how can I share it with teachers in my own practice? How can I do it in my own practice? And then how can I share it? These are two books that have really been transformational. The choice words are more for the elementary school uh, audience. This is more for the, it's, it's K to 12, but I can see how it can work from 
uh, it's more uh, more secondary than this one. Uh, so it, I learned this this from reading their books of talking about like how do we recognize students' behavior and how do we praise it in a way that they can be self advocating in the future and learn these skills. Oh, I see people chatting. What are they saying? Mm -hmm. I, I love this comment from Laura. She says, human beings are not human doings, that we need to be modeling grace and compassion for self and others in order to increase capacity in humans. Yes, that exactly goes back to what I said before. Like my current practice is trying to slow down my practice to still teach the content and the standards and the strategies that I have to teach that, I'm, uh, that my curriculum says, but in a way that still slows it down a bit where students, I get to teach SEL integrated mm -hmm. within my practice, right? Yeah, and I, I just love this idea, you know, and there's been a, a little bit of chat earlier about this, but this idea of, you know, teachers feeling pressure if you only have 30 minutes or 45 minutes with your students, that we all know how important SEL is, especially now in times like we're in now, uh, where you don't get to spend a lot of time with your students because you don't have them, you know, in front of you for that. And so being able to integrate it into just what those lessons are is such a great way to still be able to get to your teaching point, whether it is like the one that you demonstrated with us, which I thought was fantastic, right? This idea of building a story mountain and at the same time, having the story that we're building be something around a social emotional. The other yes. thing that keeps coming out is, is to your point, Tan, is this idea of just trying to slow it down that we also have to remember that a lot of parents and, and guardians of students are under a lot of pressure right now too. And some, you know, and, and kids feel that we know that kids feel that. And right. so, you know, the, the demonstration of just, you know, you seeing that and feeling that from one of your students and giving permission for this kid to go take a nap, like go lay down for a half hour. I mean, that would be huge. And I know, I know there are some teachers that are listening. You're like, Oh man, if I did that, parents would be all over me. If I told the kid to go take a nap, but you know what? Sometimes we have to do what's right for kids, regardless yes. of what that pushback is going to be exactly. from parents. And so right. just, you know, be thinking about, you know, there, I know there's just a lot coming at us right now and, yes, you know, be is. able to just know, know that, feel it and know what our responsibility is to take care of each other first. Oh, that's well, really well you said. Go ahead, Tracy. I was, you know, I don't know who, who I'm stealing this line from, but uh, a colleague once said to me, you know, either you are, you know, whether, whether you're intentionally teaching SEL or not, in the void of you not intentionally yeah. teaching SEL, you still are, you're still teaching them, exactly. uh, <laughs> you know, basically that, um, as a person, you know, your identity maybe isn't important to learning, which is not necessarily, you know, like we, we know well, there's so much research now about psychological safety and right. that in order to learn, we have to feel safe, right? You right. have to have that baseline of comfort. Um, so I, I, I like that, that idea too, that, you know, you can either be intentional with it and do it in a way that's really going to support deep learning you can try to leave it out, but you know, the, the void of SEL is its own kind of um, anti SEL in an extent. And um, you know, either you slow down and you make time for it or eventually you're going to have to slow down. Right. Exactly. Oh, Trisha and, and Jeff, you just said it so well, there's a, there's a principle that said like um, every school has a culture. You're either creating it or because you're not creating it, you're creating a culture that you don't want. Right. And so I guess the two words that I want people to remember from this uh, workshop of uh, this webinar is that intentional and integrated. And that is what both of you have said, like we're intentional about what we're doing, but it has to be integrated. So it doesn't feel like one more thing I have to teach because I only have 30 minutes with students. Right? Really well said. Let me give you another example. This is from like this year. So uh, Zi Zhang is a student from China, uh, from a student from China and he at our school we are having stu we have students compete for um, uh, like a, to be captain of, of a sport of a team right a captain of a of a grade house team because we have four teams we have four houses in our community and they compete with each other um, and the students had to stand up and do speeches and it was broadcasted virtually and and some kids were in front of the auditorium and they were they were watching 
And Zicheng was the first student of like 20 students to go up, like the first student. And he had a script and he was shaking and his leaflet. And you wish it was like, you could see it shaking in his hand. And he, but he spoke eloquently. And when he gave, and when he came off, he sat and he listened to everyone else. And then when it was time for the announcement, and they announced who won. And of course he didn't. And when I saw that, I walked over to him. He was sitting down and he said, hey, I just want to let you know that you are an incredibly brave student to be the first student to be one of the only sixth graders to be doing this. I want to let you know that even though you didn't get it, I wanted to say that this is a wonderful opportunity. You took it and I'm still very proud of you. And I walked away and he said, he said, he said thank you, Mr. Tan. And that same day, this is what he wrote. He said, hello, Mr. Tan, I just wanted to say thank that. Thanks for encouraging me even if I didn't get elected, but I really, really appreciate your kindness, right? So that conversation that I had with him was maybe 20 seconds and I walked away, but he will remember that. So I'm saying we're finding opportunities, slowing down, we're finding opportunities. So I guess um, everything I shared so far was about being intentional and integrating it as much as possible. For those who do have opportunities to work in a structure where you have a devoted 20 minutes of class time or like uh, kids come to you, you have a cohort where it's just SEL, then I have also a structure for that. So in my school, my kids come to me, my nine kids come to me, or my 10 kids come to me. Uh, I, some, they're a mix between sixth and seventh graders and they come 20 minutes every single day. And we are just, a, it's, it's a pastoral advisory team time. We call it family time. And family time looks like this on Mondays, we share our weekend and we talk about the goal for this coming up week and students sit in a circle and they all share. And then on Tuesday, they play games and then we write in our journal. On Wednesday, there is a life skill that I want to share. And on Thursday, we continue talking about that life skill. And on Friday, we we have celebrations. Uh, but this Friday, Fridays have been morphed into merging with another uh, advisory group and just playing games. So really, we play games like twice. Right? This is like the 20 minutes that we have. So I want to share with you this particular uh, journal writing activity. I think it's really incredibly powerful. I, I just did it this year and I uh, listened to a podcast uh, about the amazing Jennifer Gonzalez and how dialogue journals can build uh, teacher and student relationships. And I said, okay, let me try it. And I did it with my kids. Um, she had an author on who's been doing this for years with her kids in physical journals. And I said, well, I don't know if I'm going to we might go back into lockdown, so I will create digital ones. And this is from the amazing slide uh, slides mania. They're on Twitter. Uh, fantastic! I don't know. They should be paying. They should be paid for their services, uh, but they give it all freely. They have a digital notebook like this. It's free, and you could change the covers. And this is what I wrote: the privacy thing. I said, um, I will always keep your this private, uh, with so I won't share with anybody. Unless, unless I ask you and you give me permission. Um, but I always, I always, but if you do something that is concerning, that is a concern of your health and uh, other students' health, then I have to report it. I'm a mandated, mandated reporter. Also, when I write back to you, make, if you feel uncomfortable, make sure you share it with your parents and uh, a, a teacher or, or a principal. Right? So this is what it looks like. So it looks like a topic here. Students write about their topic and then I respond. So we do this every Tuesday. The kids come in, they write, but they've already seen my response. And then they write to my response and then they can change topics. Oh, I see chatting, this is great. So let me give you an example. This is from Keen with permission. <laughs> uh, he's one of my students in my family, but he's also a sixth grader in my class. This is what he said about songs. He said, I really don't like songs because, oh, actually, because people have been hearing my voice. Trisha or Jeff, would you mind reading uh, one person be uh, Keen and another person be me later. Oh. Uh, I'll, I'll be the, the first person if that's okay with okay. you, Jeff. Did I catch, yeah, that's fine. did Go I get it. dibs? Nope. Okay, yeah. so. You are muted first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, songs. I don't really like songs because it gets in my head and doesn't make me focus on the task. It always reminds me of my grandfather being in the house and music that I really hate. When I come to class, I just want silence so I can focus on my work or book that I'm reading. It just annoys me and makes me very, very distracted to the bad music that I hate it. 
the songs that I usually get distracted by is some Mozart music that doesn't even calm me down or give me memories that I go through. I don't like it at all. I suggest you don't open the calm music once I step in the class. I suggest play the music when there are people being loud so they can lower their volume. The calm music doesn't make me focus at all. It makes me distracted and want to close my ears and run out of the room. But since it's a school and has strict rules, I can't or else I'll get in trouble and go to the principal's office. Note, if you have time to read this whole page, you can choose to do so or not. <laughs> I love that. And here is the response. Hi, Keen. Thank you for your lengthy response. Of course, I read everything you write each time. Yes, I will not play music for your class if it really distracts you. Is playing it super quietly not even an option? I think you are a student that gets easily distracted. So I am surprised that calm music has the opposite effect on you. It doesn't calm you down. It stresses you out even more. Let's talk about conferences. How were they for you? It was, uh, it was nice meeting your mom. She really cares about you and loves you a great deal. She is also so proud of you. Okay, so that's my response. This is what he did. When I, on that day, when we finished writing, I went to the door and I, greeted, and I said goodbye to the kids. And Keen said, I wrote a whole page. You better read it. And I was like, of course, I'm going to read it. Um, and, and this is my response to him. And what did you notice so far? Um, let's go in the chat. What, what, are, what are people noticing about uh, this response before I, I give my response, before I give my reflection? I was just saying that I notice, you know, I don't know that this conversation would have happened actually without this uh, kind of as an opportunity. Sometimes in writing, it's easier to say things. Um, and lots of folks are pointing out that you weren't judgmental exactly. in your response. Um, and again, that Keen felt comfortable and that you acknowledged his concern. And yeah. his effort. I, I like that. Like, uh, you know, the two comments of you acknowledged his effort and his concern, his effort of writing this and his concern for, um, you know, being heard. Yes. And it, in the, the non-judgmental part and recognizing his effort is huge and saying, um, yes, I heard you and I'm going to take action. And you're right, uh, Trisha, about um, how this conversation might have not happened because I've been playing music since the beginning of the school year. And this is maybe two weeks ago. And he just finally told me. And I was like, oh, wow. It's like October. Was, <laughs> this poor kid. <laughs> no, and I was like, he said to me, the speakers. And it's like quiet, like chill out cello music. <laughs> what else are people yeah. saying? Like, I like also that, you know, Ophelia points out that he felt comfortable enough to be honest with you. That's because it took time building mm. little, little bricks of like, you can trust me, you can trust me, you can trust me moments. And I think the other part is like, even you just saying like, as he was leaving that day, he's like, I wrote a whole page, you better read it. But there's something in this that, th that he took time to write, you know, yeah. and setting up journals like this, you know, if, if you're an ELA teacher, we just want kids to write. I don't care where they write or how they write. We just need them to write. And that this kid, as he's leaving your class is like, Miss Tan, you better go read it. Cause I wrote a whole page is there is some, there's almost like a, a acknowledgement of like, I did that. You know, there's, there's some power in like, look what I did today. I wrote a whole page to my teacher <laughs> and he wants to make sure you read it and respond. Right. Like there's, yeah. there's this, especially with this generation, this idea that if you're going to put something out there, whether it be on Instagram or Snapchat, that there's going to be a response, yeah. right. Exactly. They, they, they're waiting for that response to be back. Yeah. So it's very much a, a cool part of it as well, I think. Yeah, absolutely right. Thanks, Jeff, for recognizing. And, and Cecilia points out, you know, again, she, she kind of loves that you've taken the time to respond to this kind of thinking. And I'm wondering, actually, if you want to talk a little bit about just sort of the practicalities or the logistics behind this, because, you know, I, I know for some teachers who, you know, if you're a specialist, you might have 100, 150 students. So do you have any logistical advice on ways to set this up so that, uh, you know, this doesn't take over your weekends? Yes, let me stop sharing and let me share you with you the official screen that I have. Ooh, this is going to be great. You get to see the the real the real class. Okay, <laughs> so this is my private account. I'm going to switch over to my teaching account here, so you'll you'll get to see. Can you see my screen right now? Yep. 
Okay, so family time, no lines. Okay, so uh, these are my family lessons. I sent the link on Google Classroom. So Google Classroom is like an amazing digital copier and every single student has uh, the notebook now, right? So 10 students. And then what I do is I just go into on Sunday night or Monday morning, hopefully Sunday night, I just go to a student's uh, diary or journal, and then I respond to each student's uh, journal one, uh, one at a time. And this takes me maybe f up to 45 an hour uh, to, just to respond to 10 students. And I would say um, I can do this because it's only a few kids, 10 kids. I don't know how you would be able to do it with 100 kids. You might start with just one class um, or a, a certain group. Uh, but in the podcast, in the podcast that, excuse me, think in the podcast that uh, Jennifer had, she had the person talk about how do you do this with 100 days and 100 kids, and she said, I only do a class a day, right? So she yeah. so she takes her 20 on Monday, she takes another 20 on Tuesday, takes another 20 on Thursday, and so throughout the week she's able to reach 100 kids. And I was like, oh or my goodness. Yeah, or maybe maybe I'm just thinking like you could even spread it out farther, right? Depending on how many kids you have, yes. that you don't have to write, you don't have to do a journal writing every week. I mean, that's yeah. great if you do and you, and you can make it awesome. But you know, what if this is once every three weeks that there's a journal activity like this because you have that many classes, right? Absolutely. And so maybe it is, uh, maybe you you just have to stretch it out more so, to make it manageable on yourself. Um, yeah, that's a great so idea. Think there's a, you know, being able to stretch it out over, you yes. know, yes, if you can do it every week, fantastic. But if I'm a PE teacher that's seen 600 kids, mm -hmm. I might only do a journal entry. It might be once a month. We're just one, once a month, we're going to write in our journal about PE or physical health or how I'm feeling, or, you know, what have I noticed I've been eating this month or whatever it happens to be, right? Your, your journal right. around PE. So right. because once is better than none. Exactly. You do, you do once a month, that's like 12, like 10 times a year that a kid is having a conversation with you, right? Yeah. That they would never have initially. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I'm thinking of two other things I've done when I've been in that position where I've had, you know, 150 plus students, uh, you know, even asking them and, and students understand when, you know, you're honest with them too. And Hey, you know what, this week might be really busy. Sometimes I've said, just, can you also highlight the passage that if I am tight on time, I really do want to give your, you, your attention, but can you highlight the thing that, you know, you really want me to focus on, or you really need me yeah. to address. Great. Um, and then Tan, I don't know if you've done this before too, but I've also asked students to do it as like small groups. So get yeah. like a group of two or three to reflect. And then that immediately, again, if you're that teacher that has 150 plus kids, you know, that, that, you know, just the math becomes three. much kinder there. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so a group effect that could work as well. Yes. Yeah, so as long as, as, and, and another form of journal writing or reflecting would be like anonymous surveys. Like, so it'd be so much quicker, you know, responding to every kid, but at least you have students like responses. I guess I can show you what um, I did with my students. So when I talk about surveys, so let me just go to teaching slides. My goodness, I'm actually showing you my lessons, yay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when my students provide surveys, um, I always respond to them with uh, an overall survey. So here, this is my class. These are my responses from my students after the survey came back, right? And then I noticed like, here are the things you disliked. And then mm. I gave them an opportunity to see what they disliked. Say, I heard you. I need some clarification. Can you, can you complete the survey to clarify these two points? And I said, these are the themes that you said you liked. And then I said, okay, here are the things I'm gonna change. I'm gonna meet you in the middle. I can't give you what you want all the time. And I can't be the one deciding all the time because that lets me in the middle. And these are the ways that I'm meeting in the middle with students. Right. Okay. All right, let me go to the continue with the last strategy. Right. So uh, uh, Trisha, thank you for that strategy of like group one and also of highlighting the one passage you want me to talk about. So thank you for that. That was really helpful. Uh, here are topics that came up with the other journals this year already body shame, assessments, problems with friends, problems with teachers, their pets, their recent trips, and of course, COVID-19. 
So here, I guess, of course, I give responses. I always give anonymous surveys to students. And uh, this one is about how do you like the journal? And some of the, these are the responses. And then uh, Jeff or Trisha, would you be able to kindly read the re responses? This is uh, what's the purpose of writing the journals during Friday, one, uh, one, during the family time once a week? Yeah, so uh, to have someone to talk to, to get to know each other, to tell what has happened this week, to share stuff, to share your feelings privately, uh, learn more skills. Uh, another student wrote, I think that the purpose of the journal in family time is that for us to communicate how we feel so that the teacher can help us understand our feelings and for us to share how your week is going. And then the last one, it's, it's so we can have a safe place to share anything that might concern us or something that you might be curious about. Right. So they get it. They get the actual purpose of family time uh, journals. And let's see their responses. Trisha, would you mind? Uh, and I said, hey, how do you like it? So I had them rate it. And I said, why did you choose that number? I chose five because I like writing. I don't really like typing and I don't like talking about personal stuff. I don't like sharing what happened that much because I, I don't like that we have to write about stuff and talk because we don't want to, because I enjoy it, but not to the point where I'll be devastated without them. I love that. Mm -hmm. uh, I chose four because I really like family time. I really enjoy when we are playing together. I chose a five because I really enjoy writing and I want to express my feelings and more. I chose this because it's a safe outlet for anything, but I didn't give it a five because sometimes it's puzzling what you want to share kind of bored sometimes. So I will, before I respond, uh, before, um, take this time to chat in the in the box, what do you notice about some of these responses? So again, this is anonymous. So some kids like it, some kids don't. Uh, and I the context is that I gave this maybe in the end of September. So I really only have two months of building trust with students and building relationships with students during family time. And, um, and I tell them that, hey, you get to, you get to be the captain of the journal, you get to share with me what you want. Um, and I will ask you questions, but if I ask you questions, you do not have to answer questions you don't feel comfortable answering. The thing I think I, I love about it, like as you're reading those responses, Trisha, I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, that's just like, that is like right there, you have all of teenagerism, right? That's middle school right there. Everything from like, I don't wanna talk about personal stuff to like, I love writing. Like, it's just this, you know, it's, it's I just, I feel like like, you can pinpoint that being sixth and seventh grade, very easy right there with yeah. those responses, right? <laughs> I love and, that. you know, and Cecilia points out though, that, you know, she says, I noticed that students feel comfortable sharing their true feelings. Yeah. And I think that is super important. And, you know, I, I think that's, that's a real reality. How many students feel like they can be totally honest with their teacher? Right, exactly. And the reason why they're truthful is because it's anonymous. And they know that I will always respond to their uh, not to the survey to to shape their responses will shape the way I I shape um, instruct the family time and so they're going to give their personal opinion and so I use the survey the next day I sat down with them and I said hey you don't have to feel like you have to say whatever you don't want to you get to decide right and um, and I continue to reinforce why we do this and I say yeah some students actually understood that why we do this and so they. They get to see oh the responses from their peers and that has really helped as well and I, I love the idea too that you you know you keep saying that you use a lot of anonymous surveys and it's not just the anonymous survey right it's sharing those results back to your students so even like you do a lesson how was that lesson take a survey and here are the results oh my gosh you all really love that lesson or you all really didn't like that lesson and you know here are the positive things that you said and here's like being open like that again i think is a huge relationship builder and don't right. be afraid to continue to do anonymous surveys yeah. um you know i think a lot of times I hear, I hear teachers, there's a lot of this, well, what if somebody writes something bad? Well, you don't have to share. If somebody's cussing in a comment, you don't have to share that comment, yes. right? And, and when you don't share that comment, you, nobody writes it anymore because there is a part of you that you know, wants to be like, ooh, I saw my comment on screen, you know? Yes. And you know that if you're inappropriate, that's just not gonna happen, so. Yes, and then very much, go ahead, Trisha. I was just gonna say, we've, we've got a question again, just around the logistics of how you set up your surveys. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting the impression from what you're saying that this is something that you've been doing for a while. Yeah. So uh, is there any other advice that, um, that you would offer in terms of just creating 
better surveys because I think there is the piece that yes, students are being honest with you. Yes. But you know, I think there there is also an art to creating a survey that students want to engage with that they don't just feel like um, you know, is data that's going to go in the garbage. So do you have any other kind of advice in terms of what you've learned along the way of creating surveys where students do engage and they do offer, um, you know, just sort of their authentic feelings? Yes, there is a before the survey, there's a during a survey, and then there's an after a survey. And those are three things that we need to perfect. Well, not perfect, but practice. The first part of the survey is before the survey is asking questions and telling them that this is anonymous. I'm not collecting your names. Um, and then organizing it in a way that you can collect the three different groups responses. And then um, I recommend having numbers. And then after having numbers, having kids explain their numbers. Okay. And then I recommend having categories like this, like structure, like the structure in the class, because kids don't know what structures mean. And then you list out as much as possible. Um, and then uh, bullet points really help, like little things that kids can click on that are easy. And then I recommend a free response. Like how you, you are free to write anything you would like to share that I did not already ask you. That, that's the, so that's the before. The during is I just open it up. I have kids, um, I share with the link and kids respond. And, I, and what I do is I just stand in the back. Uh, I, I walk around, but I don't hover behind students. I walk around so that kids are not unlike playing on Fortnite. So normally I would sit with kids and see what the, and I'm looking at their screens, but with surveys, because I just want to monitor them and make sure they're not Instagramming, whatever, um, that I, the, the, the kids are responding and then that, that has helped. So I'm not looking at the response. Um, and then the last part is me actually reflecting with kids. Like I kind of showed you here. Here are your responses. Here is things that you disliked, things that you liked. Here, can you please clarify this? Because uh, it was like, um, I'll show you what, what they said. You make me feel comfortable in most class, most of the time, but sometimes you say things that make me feel upset. Uh, for some time, it is sometime I think Mr. Tan comes to sit next to me and makes me feel weird. So I said, hey, these two comments, if you feel this way, can you please make sure you just provide more details? Because uh, I don't know what you really mean and, and be more specific. So that has been helpful. And um, Cecilia over in the chat is saying, I wonder how you could do this with kindergarten and first grade. And one of the things I've seen is in a Google form, which is what you're using here, uh, especially with our, with our young learners, being able to uh, upload an image. So you'll notice over to the right, and I won't have you actually do it, Tan, but over to the right, you can actually insert an image. And so if you're doing kindergarten or first grade, it, we can make this entire feedback form pictorial. So maybe yeah. there's an image there of, you know, five different faces and you're going to have the student. So there's just an image. And then underneath, you're going to have a scale of one to five. That is choose the, you know, how are you feeling after today's lesson or how are you feeling this week? Uh, and then, you know, you can find different pictures pictures that could represent what you're trying to get from what kind of feedback are you trying to get from kids and now with distance learning of course you can also you know hopefully parents can help and support that as well to walk them through that but uh, to tan's point to give them numbers a number scale of one to five give them things they can check mark uh, and and for the for the youngins either you can embed video so maybe even do a video of you as a teacher asking the question and telling the kids to give you a number one through five or you can actually embed a picture and then do a number scale or something like that too. So that's what I usually see with the, with the littles. Nice collaboration, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, let's keep continuing on. This is a really, I'm surprised that teachers really like the survey. Okay, so let's do one last uh, part about, again, integrating instruction. So uh, again, this is the 29th, this is like this, Year. And I always make a, a point to talk to kids and send them emails when I notice something that's happening. Um, for example, this is what I said to Kaj. Kaj, oh, uh, Jeff or Trisha, would you mind reading? Because I've been talking a lot. Sure. Hi, Kaj. I noticed that this was the first time you sat alone. Why did you do that? It's perfectly fine, but I'm just curious. P.S. I love having you as a student. You're so happy and independent, yet you are friendly and collaborative. Truly a dream student. Hi, Mr. This, Tan. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Did I steal your did I steal your part, Jeff? No, that's fine. You can go. Hi, Mr. Tan. Some people were teasing me. Thanks for asking. There's nothing much. We just feel bad about it. But again, thanks for asking. P.S. You're my best teacher. 
I'm so sorry to hear that, Kaj. That must have really hurt your feelings. I was always teased as a middle schooler too, so I know how much it hurts. Are you comfortable sharing what they are teasing you about? Okay, I made a dancing TikTok for fun, and a lot of my followers who are my friends saw it. Then Somebody shared it and spread the news to everyone. When I arrived at school on Monday, I found out that everyone was watching my video and making fun of it. I told them in the video, it was cringe, it was true, and I didn't really care about the cringe. I just tried to dance for fun, but then everyone took it seriously and they teased me. I still don't know why they teased me, I just wanna do it for fun. So thank you for reading, uh, Trisha. What I, so then I was like, oh my goodness, this is happening, I wanna address it, but instead of like, kids you have to stop doing that like finger pointing right so this is what i did i integrated what i had my students do was we had systems we were teaching a systems unit things have to be balanced and things have to be unbalanced and things we want kids to be we want the environment to go back to being balanced and so what i had the end of the unit this is like the last day is like the last 30 minutes i had kids go and work in teams to make TikTok videos to show balance and unbalance and then back to balance so they're basically saying they're you're making cringe videos. So kids worked in teams and they made videos and then they uploaded to Google Classroom. And then this is what I did. Sorry, this is what it looks like. A, a cringe video. This is an example. Um, one of the examples. And then before I gave the video, I wrote I wrote this for kids. It said, it takes a lot of bravery and creativity to make cringe videos. More energy than it takes to tease others who create them. You are also creative and brave. Don't listen to those who tease but can't create. And so that was me consciously integrating SEL into my instruction. They could have, yes, read another 30 minutes about another case study of an environment going out of balance, but I said, what a great way to end the unit by having students do something they really like anyways, creating TikTok videos. But then I get the opportunity to teach that. And so when I talked to Kaj, I said, Kaj, how are you doing? Like, how, how, uh, how was the response? And he said, it was great. Thank you. Can you, can you explain what that means? I'm like, well, they, I don't feel teased anymore. And I feel like I can, I can create cringe videos and it doesn't really matter. I'm like, oh, okay. And, and how are the students in grade six? They're like, well, they've stopped making fun of me, but now they're making fun of other students. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't quite get it there, but you know. <laughs> Exactly, but at least they are re realizing that um, they, at least that was the message with I was able to communicate it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I love what you're talking about, Tan, because, you know, we talk all the time. Like, I can't tell you how many times we've talked about this, Trisha. You know, we talk about all the time inviting student culture into your classroom. How yes. are you inviting student culture into your classroom? And you found this idea, right, with through a, through a student who is, you know, being made fun of at school. And all of a sudden you take that and you turn around and say, oh, and like, you don't even need to know what a cringe TikTok video is. You don't. You don't need to know exactly what defines a cringe TikTok versus is a good tick like nobody need, you don't need to know that you just take something and say fine you want to you want to have some fun with cringe tiktok videos we can do it with anything you happen to do it with balance yeah. um, but you can do this in in any subject area right yeah. how are we inviting student culture into our classroom it is such a critical piece to engage a generation and the way we use students culture is by using with the medium that they're using the most and so Absolutely. i actually had to look up what is a cringe video because <laughs> i don't have <laughs> Because I'm like a dinosaur, right? And the kid, and then, uh, and I was like, oh, okay, so that's what it is. So I had my kids do it. We put it all in a compilation. I can't share with you because not all parents have said yes to the permission form. These parents have said yes, but we put it together, and then kids were able to, kids were able to laugh together and like have fun with it. And so, yeah, thank you for recognizing that. Okay, so. I, I'm, I'm a teacher of structure. We only have like 15 minutes left. I'm a teacher of structure. So I always think what structures can I bring instead of planning one shot off lessons? This is the PERMA model by Martin Seligman. He is basically the, the guru of positive uh, psychology. He's actually the one of the founders of positive psychology. And he says, these are the buckets of which we should be teaching kids. Positive emotions, relationships, accomplishments, engagement, and meaning. So throughout the year, I'm going to try to touch on these things with my students. And here's a, a video about it. I'm not going to play it, but uh, it's there for your, for your resource. 
everything that I've shared already about these five strategies came from, uh, comes from David Bott, and it's from this website, this article, and there's a podcast with him uh, in it. Here's a new book that I uh, that's coming out, and I'm going to have them on my podcast. It's from Dr. Jessica Jabaran um, Hennigan and also John uh, Hanneman, Dr. John Hanneman, and then they're talking about SEL from a distance. And so I'll be, I'm excited to share, bless you, what they are going to um, share with us as well. And here are the resources. I haven't read it yet, but I'm excited to hear, hear about it. Here's another one, but uh, the Jesse the Jesse Lewis Foundation. This is a kid from, um, it, it's a kid who was, it, the school shooting, I think in, Colorado, in uh, Connecticut, I forgot what it's called, Little something, not Little Rock, but um, there was a shooting. And um, he was a kid that saved many of his, of his classmates. Um, and when he passed away, his mom created a foundation. And now the foundation has, um, it's an SEL foundation. Like there's a curriculum to teach teachers Share, help, te help teachers how to teach SEL. And there are whole units on it. So it's really great. You can look up um, Choose Love Enrichment Program and the Jesse Lewis Foundation. They have like grades from like grades uh, one, I think, or pre-K to all the way to 12. So here's my wrap up. Um, SEL is about teaching emotional intelligence and fostering relationship by using specific strategies such as unteach, play, build, build trust, speak human, and be human. We do this by looking for teachable moments for SEL with consciously integrated instruction together. And we do this by using the content as a topic to teach emotional awareness. And we have to do this because students need the skills to navigate their experiences and to process their emotions. Again, it's that in, intentional instruction um, and, and in, integration. So in, let's, let's end with a little chat. Um, I always end my, my podcast with this. Uh, red, you can pick one of the colors. Red is, from this webinar, what is something that you're going to stop doing? Yellow is, what is something you could do to slow down your practice? Your green is, what is something that you could start doing more of in your practice? You can chat away, and then uh, Trisha and Jeff will be facilitating that chat. And I, I just wanted to touch on, you know, I, I really love that you that you have emotional intelligence kind of at the, at the heart of that. And I shared a, a link in the chat. You know, I, I think there's also just practical reasons we want to make sure that's embedded. So Forbes did a great piece on why emotional intelligence is such an essential um, asset for anyone who is looking at going in into a leadership direction in their career pathways. So I do think you know, unfortunately, sometimes people might see SEL as tokenistic or, you know, I think that soft, even just the connotation of soft skills sometimes gives, gives it just the, oh, you know, it's, it's not as important, but it is. And I, you know, when I think of leaders who I've had the, the pleasure to work with who have that piece, that's yeah. always been for me the thing that sets them apart. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love that Lorena shares, I'm going to stop teaching it as a separate component. Nice. Um, and uh, a few people mentioning that they're going to try out that that notebook, mm. the power of praise words. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Lorena, thank you for adding the the link. She, someone asked for it, and I noticed that you put it in there. So thank you for doing that for them. Yeah. Annabella shared a red, uh, the using praise words such as great and very good. And that is something, it is so hard, but it's something I think we constantly work on in our practice, right? Uh, just what are the words that we're using when we praise students? Yes. I think it's always a good reminder for all of us. I mean, I still work at that and it's really, really hard. Quite a few people talking about, uh, you know, using story more. And again, I'm thinking of, you know, great le leaders I've worked with or amazing peers I've had. I do think they're great storytellers too. Um, and I, I just, I really love how you modeled that because sometimes I think it's easy for us to say, oh, you know, just tell, share stories. But I think there's a fine balance and you modeled it so well, Tan, where, you know, you can share a story that doesn't necessarily take 40 minutes, right? Because I, I think also sometimes people think like, oh, you know, all he does is tell stories in the class. But no, it's it's like, you know, what you've been saying with SEL, it's embedded. It's it's sort of the, the sidecar that comes with the learning. Oh, right. what, what a nice analogy. I think about it like our content is our bricks, right? And then the SEL the, is the mortar in between the bricks. Mm -hmm. that, that, I love that. Together, That's right. right? I like that. And I also think you kept, uh, both you and Jeff have said things, this uh, initially, 
um, but I haven't been able to share it, but it's Maslow's before Bloom's. As a teacher of language learners, we know that in our field, the effective filter, when kids are feeling stressed or threatened or intimidated, they're not going to participate. And so, but this is true for students who are not language learners, right? And so we have to create a culture and environment where students are feeling like, one, they are safe, two, they're heard, and three, they are valued. Hmm. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, here is a survey. I already put it in the little link for you. You can take a picture of this. And again, of course, this is an anonymous survey. I'll be sharing this with um, Jeff and Trisha for future uh, feedback and shaping of the process. And uh, that is it. I'll go back to the slide for in one second. And it's already shared in the thing. But I have a course, uh, a scaffolding learning course and a teacher collaboration course is going to happen in the summers because I, I teach 100 kids and I don't have time to facilitate another course. But I also have a blog post, a blog, uh, a blog and a podcast um, for teachers of language learners. So thank you again for uh, coming to a webinar on Friday at like four noon. And Trisha and Jeff, thank you for facilitating being the voices for teachers. I, I know I know they felt really uh, heard. Yeah. Well, and I was just Go gonna ahead. say, you know, Tan, I think thank you for being so inclusive with everyone. And I'm thinking, you know, a webinar on a Friday afternoon could have had a much different feel, but I think because again, you were so invitational because you were sharing personal stories, I, I think, you know, we even experienced how that just creates a completely different learning environment. Right, right. I think this is another story. Here, I'll give you a story. When Trisha um, she, uh, invited me to do this and I said, oh, can we do breakout groups? And because of, because it's, this is a podcast, we weren't able to yeah. do that. And I was this close to saying, well, then I can't do it. And I said, but no, let's work with the constraints, right? Let's work with it. And I worked with them. I said, okay, not a problem. We're just going to be really intentional with our chats. We're going to be saying people's names throughout. And I felt like it was a really positive way of doing that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. No, oh, thank but you. So you're already getting you're getting feedback of people saying that they, they appreciate not doing feed out feedback, you know, breakout groups Friday at four o'clock after a week of <laughs> teaching. So, yeah. you know, sometimes, but I love that because sometimes what we think, you know, when we when we are forced to pivot, we find new ways of doing things that and we we because we, we push ourselves to restructure things in a new way. And all of a sudden you're like, you know what? That actually worked okay. Yeah. Uh, and we just have incredible people that show up to these, you know, uh, Tan, I mean, it's 6am. Thank you for getting up, uh, and doing this. And I tell you what, you look a lot better than me at 6am on a Saturday morning, my friend. I mean, geez, Louise, you know, very well put together. So I appreciate that. Uh, and, and thanks for all you're doing and all, all you're doing on the internet. Uh, again, his Twitter handle, and you're going to want to follow it is behind Trisha and I, uh, if you're on the, if you're on the Twitter, uh, it's worth going there as well. And uh, if you can, if you want to, you can send us a voice recording uh, and send that over to info at shiftingschools.com. And we will make sure that you are also uh, get your voice in our podcast as well. So thank you all very much for being here on a Friday night or a Saturday morning or whatever time it happens to be while you're watching this. Tan, thank you so much uh, for sharing your your experience your knowledge with all of us and, and for sharing so much stuff free you know uh, check out his podcast it's incredible as well as long with his blog posts and all the other resources that he has and things coming up so thanks everyone uh, wishing you have a great weekend ahead may monday come slowly <laughs> <laughs> i love that okay bye